Hello, everybody. Welcome to Room 5. Next speaker is Michael Hockley. He is Associate Professor in the Economy of Russia, Eastern Europe, and Eurasia from St. Antonis College at the University of Oxford. And he is presenting the authoritarian surveillance. Let's welcome. Please. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much for, for joining this session. This is the first time that I'm presenting at this conference, so I'm new to, I'm new to the, the context. And what I'm going to present this morning is a project, more like a, a project more than a research paper. The title is Authoritarian Surveillance, Innovation and Big Data, and it's a project that we started when I was still working at the University of Bremen in, in, in Germany with a number of colleagues, with a PhD student of mine, a, a colleague, uh, Torben Klaal, another professor. And uh, what we try to study in this project is uh, uh, artificial intelligence as a new technology that is like introducing a new paradigm shift in the world. We had the internet 20 years ago that really changed things. And now we are at the border of like a new big change. If you think the, the changes being introduced by AI in the last two, three years with ChatGPT with other programs are really fundamental. And we see that there's a, there's a big competition between different countries, different players in the world that try to leverage this, this technology. And uh, especially that the two main players really in the field are two countries that are far ahead of everyone else. And this is the United States and China. Now, what we try to study in this project is, if you look at these two countries, at least until now, <laughs> they have very different political institutions. China is an authoritarian communist state with a huge communist party and a centrally organized bureaucracy, whereas the United States, until, I mean, today is a democracy. It might change in the future, but for, for now, <laughs> we... Um, very different institutions. The, the way that science works in these two countries are also very is very different. And in the United States, we have a decentralized university systems with a lot of freedom where researchers and professors can basically decide in which direction they want to do their research. In China, it's centrally directed. It's really like focus money is being uh, given to those institutions that do what the party wants them to do. And uh, so we have these two different contexts. And what we try to study in this in this project is which context is better suited to get in to obtain an advantage in producing innovation in artificial intelligence and um so do you have a, a point or should i just like to switch to, to the next slide then yeah um so i'll start this talk with a picture from 2016 from from those of you in the room do you know what this this picture shows what what happened and have you seen this before this was in 2016, in March 2016, in Seoul, in, in, in South Korea. And the gentleman you see here on the right is Lee Sedol. He is the world, the, the, was the world champion at the time in the game of Go, which is the, a Chinese strategy game, which is much more complicated than chess. It's one of the most complicated and difficult games to play. It, if you look at the, the board, you have like a board with 200 squares, and you have white and black stones, and you put them alternately uh, on, on the board. And the, possible, like the possibilities of different combinations on the Go board Board is larger than the number of atoms in the universe. You have to imagine like the universe is huge and then atoms are really small and uh, there are more combinations on this board than atoms in the universe. So it's really, really complicated. And this is why Go until 2016 was never had, had never been solved by computers. You couldn't just cal calculate. Chess was solved in the late 90s. You remember the game between Kasparov and uh, Deep Blue, IBM, and Kasparov lost. But until 2016, no computer was able to beat the world champions in Go. And the world champions in Go, they came all from Asia. They come from South, uh, from Korea, from Japan, and from China. Uh, and then in 2016, there was a group of researchers from London, uh, DeepMind um, Institute, that was using AI to play the game of Go. And they developed a software called AlphaGo, which was playing this game. And uh, uh, so, but everyone expected in the expert community that uh, Lisa Doyle would still win. Against, against the computer. But surprisingly, in Seoul, Leaf lost four games and only won the last one. And it was a massive victory of this artificial intelligence, which by then, um, I mean, it was an emerging technology, but not as present at, not as now, eight years later. And uh, this, uh, especially in Asia, this caused a lot of shockwaves, especially in China. It was a bit of a, a Sputnik moment. But like you remember the Sputnik moment in 1957, when the United States woke up as the, when the Soviets had their first satellite in space before, the, before the, the Americans. And here in 2016, a group of Western scientists with a new technology is managing to win in this most Asian of games against the best player of Asia. And in, in China in particular, government, the government woke up and said, this is a technology we have to invest in. And then they put a lot of money. And since then, uh, if you go to the next slide, okay, okay. 
or, uh, or go ahead, uh, one, one additional slide, there should be a graph in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, here we see, uh, uh, so we see this as uh, publications in the field of artificial intelligence. And this graph shows both publications quality-wise and just the, 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 the quantity. So this is just the overall number of all publications in the field of artificial intelligence between 2015 and 2021. This is, these are publications in the nature index. So these are the top level journals in the field of artificial intelligence. So this is more like high quality publications. And you see different countries that do research in artificial intelligence. We see uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, South Korea, India, they're all clustered in the lower left corner of this graph. Then we see the United States. They are still far ahead in terms of quality. They are, it's really the cutting edge research is being done in the United States, in mostly in California, with a couple of institutions that are really pushing ahead uh, the, the frontiers of science and artificial intelligence. However, if you think about the overall quantity, and this is really a result of this push, which was initiated after 2016 in China, uh, China is far ahead of everyone else. So there's a huge army of researchers that are now pushing forward um, research in the field. And surprisingly, I mean, interestingly, this graph, this is from until 2021, this is the last data that we could could get. We had an earlier graph, an earlier version from an earlier version of our first paper, where China was um, was kind of was here two years earlier. So they moved in this direction very, very fast. So they're catching up. And coming back to the to our project. So um, if you can go to the next slide. There are three important inputs when you want to promote research in artificial intelligence. You need to build the algorithms, the, what uh, scientists call the architecture of, uh, of a model, of an AI model. And then for this, you need cutting edge talent. You really need really smart people who build these, these, these new algorithms. And here the United States still has an advantage. The United States, they still have an advantage. They have really smart people that are uh, working on the frontier and then China is not yet there. However, China has a big advantage with respect to data, because once we have your algorithms, you have to train them. And the more data you have, the better you can train them. The more data is almost always better to train these algorithms. And this is where our uh, kind of project is focusing in, because uh, think about um, uh, like, uh, accessibility to data and then compare China to many other Western democracies, the United States, but also countries in, in Europe and elsewhere in the, in the world, China has built this huge surveillance apparatus where they gather facial recognition, like pictures of people, bundle them with other data from the pension fund, from government administration, and then they're giving this data to firms and companies as a kind of subsidy, as a production subsidy, as an input to develop the next generation of models. And this is where China has an advantage. And here, the, 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 the question who is winning this race in artificial intelligence really comes down to which of these two factors is becoming is, is more important at the end of the day. And we don't know yet. And so we try, in our project, we try to test this. Which of these factors is more important? And this could then give us an answer uh, who is going to win this race in artificial intelligence. The, the third factor that also plays a role is what is called in the, in like in the, in the field of AI, compute or computing power. It's just like the number of computers you have to run your models, because this is very computational and intensive stuff. And for compute, you need chips, computer chips, which are mainly built in Taiwan. And now you can understand why Taiwan is, why there's this crisis around Taiwan and why both countries try to keep control over Taiwan. Because interestingly, although China has pushed forward um, with various industry policy programs, its ability to build computer chips, they are not yet there. Uh, it's it's really the United States still have an edge, and uh, mainly the most advanced computer chips that come from Taiwan. So control over Taiwan is really important in this in this respect. And yeah, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, so um, but in in our project, we we focus on these. So computing power is a bit of a, a stalemate for the time being, and with the United States having a slight edge, data China seems to have. Uh, a large edge and algorithms the United States to have an edge. So these are the two things that we, we that we try to test. Now we can go to the next slide. So what we have for now is we build a theoretical model. We have a, a first book chapter. I think and this was the link that was in the program. Uh, and you can access them if you want. I mean, if you're interested, you can send me an email and I can send this PowerPoint because the PowerPoint has links to all these publications. But you can also find them on my, on my website uh, website under working papers. So this is a book chapter that came out in 2022 where we kind of tell the story. Then we built a model, a theoretical economic model that came out in 2023, where we really show this trade-off between um, 
scientific discovery and having large amounts of data. So we, we can go to the next slide, which is the, the model. And so our hypothesis in the model is that uh, in terms of scientific research, democracies have an advantage because uh, there's less control, there's more freedom to think and to cooperate. You can go to international conferences. And I, I myself, I was working for five years at the higher school of economics in Moscow until 2017. And then you could really see until 2017, it was perfectly possible to do real scientific research in the social sciences in Russia. And then it became more and more difficult. We had in, in 2017, a vice rector was appointed to this university who was before the head of the FSB of the Secret Service in the region of Belgorod. And then this guy started looking at the programs of our workshops and crossed out certain topics and said, yeah, this topic, corruption, for example, shouldn't be investigated too much. Or electoral fraud is not a topic that they want to see in the programs of their conferences. But for example, the efficiency of the public administration is something which we can still study. And uh, so, you, so there's this, um, this kind of advantage of democracies, but then uh, China autocracies have a big advantage in terms of data availability. However, this depends on on the support of the population, and this is this is also kind of really interesting, uh, that uh, for now in China, people are very happy and open to share their data. And so this is something we wanted to investigate a bit more in, in detail. I have to put a bit on the time because <laughs> we, we have like uh, 10 minutes left, I think, no? Um, very briefly, if you want to dive deeper in this, this the subsidy question, the data given to firms to produce the next generation of AI models, Beracha, they have really good, they have a, three papers that came out in the last two years, Martin Beracha and his co-authors, all on top level journalists, really, really cool stuff. And uh, I can only recommend these papers. Let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so in our theory paper, we have this trade-off. Um, Surveillance causes a cost in terms of scientific discovery because these universities are controlled, but there's a benefit because you can use the data to uh, promote like the training of your models. And what we try to investigate empirically is which of these two factors is more important at the end of the day. And this decides the race in AI. This is kind of our, our premise. Next slide. Uh, so this gives us a number of research questions that then we can test empirically by looking at the data, by doing surveys, by, by studying what is actually going on in the world. The first one on which we are focusing is citizens in different contexts. Uh, how likely are they to share their data with the state and what is determining their willingness to share data with the state? And this is something you can study, for example, with survey experiments. You ask people and then you give some groups in your experiment, you split it up, your sample, you give them different treatments, what the state is going to do with the data, and you look at the reaction. And this is this is actually not trivial. If you speak with people in Russia or in China, often they tell you, we know that the government is, is, is looking at us anyway. So the surveillance is kind of counted in, in this behavior. This is a, this is a hypothesis. And uh, what we're trying to test if, if people are being told that the data can be used against them, do they change their behavior or do they keep this behavior similar? And, um, and, so, and then we also want to test the effect of surveillance on creativity, but this is something we want to do in the future. If you go to the next slide, this is really a question that we have already tested. And so in the last five minutes, I'm going to present you the results of this first empirical test that we look, where we looked at different countries and at the willingness of citizens to share the data with the state. Next slide. So this is this paper, which you can also download, which is already being reviewed by, by a journal, Authoritarian Surveillance and Public Support for Digital Governance Solutions. So you might uh, know that, I mean, many countries are now introducing so-called digital governance platforms or solutions, where you can pay your taxes, you can get different, different governance services, but the government also has your data and knows what you are doing. And uh, China is doing this with a social credit system, which is becoming increasingly sophisticated. But Russia has the same thing, with, which is called Gos Uslugi, so the services of the state. Ukraine has one, which is really interesting, which is called the Java IA, so the, the, the state and myself, which, uh, for example, if your apartment is bombed, you can send a message to the government on your app, and they send somebody to repair it, and all kinds of services that are bundled in this. Estonia is very advanced in this respect. So, uh, but uh, these services function when people are willing to share their, their data with the state and when they trust the state. So what we want to study here is what is determining the, the yeah, the willingness of people to share their data. Go to the next uh, next slide. And um, so we conducted a survey experiment in 2022, in the, in the fall of 2022, in five different countries, in Russia, Estonia, Germany, the United States, and Turkey. 
and we measured the approval for our digital governance solutions. And in this, so it's a big group of people. You ask them, do you would you be happy to introduce a digital governance solution in your country? And then you split up this group. And before you ask them the question, you give them different treatments. What is going to happen with the data? It's going to be used for public services. It's going could potentially be used to identify or to fight crime, or it could be used to uh, repress unauthorized political protests which is kind of our repression treatment. And then we want to see how people react to these different treatments, which we can see on the next slide. So this is our, these are our results for Russia. And uh, so you remember, I, I told you that uh, we, it's really not, not that clear cut, cut beforehand how people react to especially the repression treatment, which is the one in the third, third column. Some people told us beforehand that they would expect there is nothing different because people expect anyway that the Russian state is use, using this data to also control them. However, if you tell them, especially for Russia, there's a huge decline. Here we have 75% approval in the control group. It drops to below 50% when you tell people that the state can use this data against you. And um, so this is data from Russia because we couldn't do it in China. We would have liked to do it in China, but doing these kind of surveys in China is no longer pos possible. And even in Russia, it was very complicated, but through back doors, we were able to, to do this survey. And uh, because what we know from other studies is that in China, approval is very high, it's at 80, 85%. But what happens if you tell people in China that uh, the state is using this data for control? And then it might go down. And then the ability of the state to gather data for artificial intelligence research might also decline. So this is an important determinant here. If you go to the next slide, we see like this is all kinds of different factors that are influencing approval for these digital governance solutions. We have um, if the state is using it, to be, uh, using it to police crime, approval goes down a bit. But if the state is using it for purposes of repression, it, approval is going down a lot. So it's almost the, the strongest um, determinant here. If you bundle them both, it goes down, but not as much. But uh, on the other hand, if people like what the government is doing, is they're supporting Vladimir Putin, which was our question in the survey, approval for this digital governance solution goes up by, by a lot. Same form trust in public services, and interestingly, if you get your information from this from state TV, if your main source of information is state TV, you're also more likely to trust the government to imp implement these solutions and to share your data with the state. So propaganda plays a role. And this is kind of, in, in Russia, this is something really important because many people still watch TV as their main source of information. And um, so I think I have to wrap up because we also need to have some time for, for questions and answers. But if you go to the next slide, we see uh, these are the results for the other countries. And um, for all countries, we have kind of similar results. It's statistically significant for Estonia, Germany, and Turkey that the repression treatment has the biggest effect. Whereas for the United States, it's not significant. Uh, it's not, uh, there is an effect, but it's not, like there's no statistically significant difference. Um, yeah, uh, to, uh, to the next slide. Yeah, so what, what we see is that awareness does seem to play a role. And if people know that their data can be used against them, they're less likely to use it. And then this advantage of autocracies is declining. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big puzzle. And this is like a small piece for this big puzzle to answer this question where the data is coming, uh, to what extent citizens share the data with the state and why China for now has this big advantage with the data and what are the determinants. And in the future, we are trying to build a whole a range of other studies. We want to look at the Belt and Road countries, where now China is exporting surveillance technology to, uh, and to see how citizens in these countries see these data questions. And then we also have, I don't have the time, but <laughs> if you go to the next, the next uh, last but one slide. So we have a, a bunch of additional projects where we are applying for funding at the moment. We want to test, for example, how surveillance affects creativity in a lab experiment. So we have people sitting in a labo laboratory, they sit in front of computers, they have to do simple tasks. And at one point we simulate surveillance control by having, I don't know, we, a picture of Vladimir Putin or a policeman walking up and down in the room or something like this. And so they have to make these tasks and in the other room it's completely free to see how surveillance control is affecting creativity. And it, again, it could go both ways if there's pressure you might um, have more energy to work because you are, this was like how Stalin built the nuclear bomb in 1949. He put just all these uh, scientists in the labor camp, told them you, you're not going to see your families until the point when we have a nuclear bomb. So they worked very hard under pressure, under control. They had worked. But on the other hand, if you really need new, completely new uh, solutions in AI and you, the next big generational change thing, probably if there's also always a policeman looking at the, the back of your neck, you're less creative than in a completely free environment. So this is what we want to test in this in this project. And we have a couple of other projects, but I, for the sake of time, <laughs> I stop here and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Yeah, I 
I'm super fascinated. Thanks a lot. I have a question regarding the regarding the server because I was actually glad so we need to use the microphone for that. Okay. Zoom this for the people are sure. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot again. Um, so the thing is, um, I was expecting for Germany, for instance, mm. I would have expected like in terms of control, like 90% mm. of people saying, of course, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. What exactly was the question you asked during the survey? And do you know the sample size by any chance? Yeah, uh, so the sample size for Germany, for these four other countries was a thousand respondents, whereas for Russia, we had more, we had a thousand six hundred. And then the question was, uh, if the data is being used to repress unauthorized political protests. So basically, illegal political protest. We call, I mean, the, the main experiment is for Russia, where this term unauthorized political protest is a synonym for any kind of opposition protest, because every protest by the opposition is, by definition, unauthorized. So it, for, for Germany, it's a bit more tricky to interpret this. And so the, 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 the additional four experiments, we have them as a backup, basically, as a bit of a, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, an amazing conference. Um, I, I have arrived a little late and I don't know if you are talking about the use of uh, digital identity technologies in order to get surveillance. Because uh, I, I'm working on digital mm -hmm. identity and the most uh, used technologies are biometric technology mm -hmm. or credential federated or centralized in which provider, private provider can get a lot of uh, data from people, but also, for a state like China or India with a Hadar system, they take digital identity as a, a way to arrive to a big amount of data yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from that allow them in order to, to be able to get surveillance in everyone because mm -hmm. it's a mandatory regime. Yeah. So uh, have you uh, uh, connected your research with the fact that digital identity is the only way to access to services in the digital world. Mm -hmm. And it's something like, at the end, it's um, almost mandatory for everyone. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I think it's public a, and, yeah, public yeah. And, and private authorities can get a lot of, of data and, and surveillance. Yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it really goes, it's, it's super interesting because it goes both ways. It's a, a positive feedback loop. Do we have five more minutes? Oh, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's go, it goes in both directions. So um, the more data you have, the better you can construct your surveillance um, technology, but also the the services that you offer and improve them, and then you can get even more data, and then they get they get better. And uh, then, of course, countries have the possibility by putting their services or essential services on digital platforms to force people to adopt them. So this is also a question that we are struggling or that we are looking at here in in detail is um, to what extent people can still decide by themselves uh, to participate in these solutions or not. But here again, we have there's Gina Kostka at the University of the Freie University in Berlin, who does really interesting stuff on this for China, where she showed that it's really the willingness still matters. So sometimes governance in local Chinese uh, regions and cities try to in, in, like introduce solutions, but the people don't really participate. They don't, but not not necessarily because they're afraid, but just because they don't like them that much. Or uh, and sometimes they participate because there's a gamification element, or or they approve of it. And then understanding approval of the population is important both in in our context and in our authoritarian context for these things to work at the end i mean even if you have, have a digital identity in india and nobody uses it for some reason the government can't really get the data so people have to like it and this liking it this is what we study here that we try to understand what is determining that people like this kind of stuff Uh, there are a lot of countries in Africa doing uh, uh, developing uh, biometric uh, identity methods yes. uh, helped with by helped by China in order to get more data. And it's surprising that uh, in this country that is is usually recognized as a country in which legal identity was uh, filed was not a uh, main digital identity is mm, developing in. Um, a faster way even than in Europe. Yeah, yeah. helped by China because they need more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because they're exporting this. It is, this is also, you could, there's another paper by the Baracha guys, which is called AI Toxy, where China is exporting this kind of technology, in particular to countries that are 
in between being a democracy and an autocracy. And once they get the technology, they become more autocratic. And then there's a, there's a kind of a ratchet effect because once we have it, you can control your populations better. And it's more difficult to get back to the, you become an autocracy and the pendulum can't go back because you have the tools in place to control your populations. And at least Baracha and his colleagues, they, they argue that China does this strategically to uh, influence people, countries to become more authoritarian. So super interesting. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm coming at this with a bit of a publisher's view. So I'm, I'm just curious about the data that you presented in that first graph that we saw. Um, I'm curious as to why you chose to plot it um, according to the nature journals rather than, you know, individual citations. Um, I think it's quite telling that, you know, the ones further along the you know, that axis tended to be Western journal, uh, Western countries, which makes sense. You know, the nature journals are based in yeah. Britain. They're published by a British German publisher. Um, and furthermore, you know, journals are often ranked by this prestige based on an average. Um, so, you know, being published in a high ranking journal does not necessarily infer that the paper itself will get a large amount of sites. I'm just curious whether you think, you know, how different that graph would be if it was based, you know, on individual articles yeah, yeah. from those countries rather than, you know, that kind of, it's, it's a bit of a geographical yeah, bias yeah. there. No, it's, it's, a, it's a proxy that we use to proxy quality and as compared to our publications, we have a similar, we did similar stuff with citations and also with patents. And the picture is roughly similar. I mean, it's it's, it's a bit different uh, according to the, the, the indicator that you use, but you get kind of the similar picture in terms of China and the United States being far ahead of everyone else and China having more publications but a bit lower quality stuff. I mean, the, the patents, they have way more patents but they're less being cited and the same for citations. Uh, so, yeah, I, mean, I think that the the picture is pretty robust and there's, there's a good book. It's a bit old already from 2019, AI Superpowers by Lee Kuan Yu or something. Uh, yeah. By the former uh, Google head uh, when Google was still in China. And uh, like he discusses this competition between China and the United States. In my view, this is still the best, best book that is kind of treating this question. Yeah. If nobody wants to ask a question, I'm going to ask on uh, the last one. Um, it might be difficult to, to answer though. So I, I was especially again interested like in terms of Germany and in terms of what you said, you know, e-governments and stuff. Because in Germany, I mean, you, you're a German as well. You know that we're incredibly lagging behind incredibly. And like at least what what I've heard, but that is I have no data to prove that. Which is what I've heard is that there is this absolute reluctance to give away your data, um, which is uh, d why is that? Do you think it's historical because of the Third Reich? And why, for instance, I mean there are other democracies. Okay, they had a Soviet past, but Estonia, for instance, is super advanced. Why? Why? Why is Germany? So uh, super interesting question. There's a question that we have also asked ourselves, and then. If we get some funding, this is, would be another research project to have a really nicely designed survey study or to see what are the determinants in Germany in particular, if they're historically determined. I mean, I could imagine that this plays a role, that uh, if you trigger people, remind them of what happened in the Third Reich and then in, in the 30s and the 40s in Germany, then there is a big reluctance to share your date. Although, I mean, here in this, in this we didn't really see it so much, but these are hypotheses that uh, I don't really know of any good study that is measuring this in a, in a, in a rigorous way. So this would be a, a project to, to carry out and then look both at the, the willingness to share the data of people in Germany, but also why, if they don't want to share the data, why this is the case. Is, uh, are they afraid of, uh, and then is there, is there a difference, for example, between East Germany that was a dictatorship until three years, uh, 30 years ago and West Germany, where this, uh, which is a democracy since 1945. And then you can look at all kinds of different determinants and uh, super interesting questions. So we have to work on this in the future. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any more questions? There is no question on Zoom. So thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Yeah. Thanks for your time and presentation. Thank you for attending. This was a good session.